Okay, hello and welcome back. So I'm actually doing this a slightly different way than I did this the last time. I'm actually going to be looking at the pictures that I'm choosing to use instead of um, recording this audio and then picking the pictures later like I did in the first, um, whatever we're calling this content. So um, I'm actually going to be um, looking at the pictures and recording this and my notes. So hopefully I can actually do a far better job or at least a job that I um, find more satisfying than I have in um, my last video. So anyways, we are going to be doing the Southern Pacific Coast route today, which I'm um, on the map. Hopefully I will have highlighted in red, which is from San Francisco to Los Angeles. Um, sorry that the map is in not incorrect, but just not geographically the most um, great because this is the SP system map from one of their schedules during the depression. So, yeah, we're kind of living with it because I can't find a better one. Um, anyways, the coast route um, had some of the most famous trains on the West Coast as well as some of the Southern Pacific's most popular and profitable trains throughout its history. So the coastline began its um, life as a, a very humble railway just there to connect San Francisco, which was at the time California's business hub, and San Jose, which was at the time the state capital. So the connection was started in the late or the early 1860s and finished in 1864 um, between San Francisco and San Jose. This actually forms the beginning of the modern Caltrain system, which, or at least line because it's not really a system. Um, between San Francisco and Gilroy. Um, the coastline wasn't finished until 1901 and, well, partially finished until 1901, and the last major part was finished in 1904, which was Santa Susana Pass. The main issue was building a lot of the bridges over the various creeks and chasms in between um, Northern and Southern California. As for the Peninsula Commute, that will get be part of its own video and or lumped in with the NorCal locals, which I will do eventually. But anyways, <clears throat> the Peninsula, because Peninsula Commute is all the part of the coastline, it's still somewhat separate considering it was a much different service and uh, much more memorable in its own right. So many different trains ran the coastline between San Francisco and Los Angeles, but the Coast Daylight was the most famous of the trains that ran the route. Um, there were other passenger trains that did run the route, like I mentioned, there were the Peninsula Commute trains, which at least ran the San Francisco to um, San Jose part line. There was also the Del Monte, which again I'll get into in the NorCal Locals iteration of this, whenever the hell that is. There were also various mail trains, there were also various secondary trains that weren't necessarily named, um, and there were also work trains that preceded the daylight. For example, the daylight name was actually used on a secondary train that ran, well not a secondary train, but a non-stop heavyweight train like the one in the picture. Between San Francisco and Los Angeles, it ran non-stop and took 12 hours to make its entire run, which ironically is as fast as the Coast Starlight runs today. But anyways, this is actually a Peninsula commute train that we're, I'm using to um, sub in for a picture of heavyweight trains since I can't really find anything good um, from before the 1930s, so we're going with a picture of a commuter train from the 1950s. But anyways, the Coast Daylight's official run was from March 21st, 1937 to May 19th, 1974, and there were many things that made the Daylight a marvel of its time. It had radios in each car, the triple section diner, a movable baggage storage compartment, and air conditioning. One of the main attractive features was the mountain type Golden State locomotives of which there were five types built through um, I believe it was the 1930s during the SP's um, big investment in itself during the depression. There was the GS1s which were not streamlined, the GS2s which were the first to pull the daylight train consists, the GS3s which were built to run, run longer trains, and then the GS4s, which are still run to make run even longer trains, and the GS5s, which looked like the GS4s, but were slightly better, and I think only two were ever made because um, they were built at the end of 1941, and then the war started, and obviously steel became a um, rap big wartime necessity, so trains were kind of left on the wayside. So when the Southern Pacific initially started sparing the uh, planning the coast daylight they spared no expense into in creating it um, which was part of their depression era push to keep people not only riding the trains but to keep the trains profitable um, and the SP after shopping around ended up settling on the um, Golden State dubbed steam engines as well as spending a million dollars per train set um, to get new trains which um, they bought from Pullman and um, one million dollars in 19 I believe it was 1936 
what is about 18.5 million in 2020 dollars and also for comparison the initial round trip ticket on a in a chair car was 14 dollars um, in 1937 which is 255 dollars in 2020 and a first class ticket was 20 dollars and 25 cents or 368 dollars in 2020 the prices are high but the coast daylight was the first class train whether you were in first class or the chair car um, as i said there were secondary trains running the line as well as tertiary um, mail trains which you could spend um, less money up to half off to ride the train for 13 hours but again this was the first class train that took nine out nine and a half hours or actually it was nine hours and 45 minutes when it was pulled by a steam engine which again was significantly faster so the difference in some of the main distinguishing features um, of the daylights versus the other trains that ran the coast route was the fact that the daylight was a streamlined train whereas the other trains were generally using older heavyweight equipment and other innovations like the diners, air conditioning, the movable baggage holds. A little note on that air conditioning prior to the 1930s was generally a non-existent thing on trains, let alone anywhere else. And one of the main um, pushes by the SP to keep people on passenger trains during the depression was to buy not only new trains, but to actually outfit some of their older trains with air conditioning, which again also was part of their depression air push because it did keep a bunch of people employed. Um, at this point, the, the SP was actually a little bit more, um, how do I put it? They thought more of that the, the depression wasn't going to be as long as it actually was. So they actually did invest money as um, there was deflation, which I'll probably end up doing another video on that separately because it was a very interesting time in the SP's history. Also at this point, um, air conditioning with steam powered instead of um, a compressed refrigerant because at the time the primary refrigerants were propane or ammonia which um, the trains crashed either would mean an explosion or a toxic cloud so they were not generally safe also at the time um, train electricity was generated from an alternator attached to the axles um, whereas modern trains either if it's an electric powered train, just draw the power from the overhead wires, or if it's a diesel train, there's just a secondary generator in the engines that generate electricity for the rest of the train, which is generally a lot cheaper than the axle thing. But air conditioning was a game changer that did draw people back to the trains and what made the daylight one of the most profitable things in the system. Another smaller innovation was the um, removable baggage holds on the trains themselves, which would allow um, the porter and passengers to load um, carrying on baggage into a compartment and then have the compartment be raised into the train, which meant you didn't have to carry the bags onto the train, which was just a little point of convenience, but it was just something that made people happier. Secondary point is having um, Pullman porters um, on the trains, which is from what I understand a thing that most daytime trains didn't have at the time, but it was a new addition. And the Pullman porters themselves are kind of like an airline steward, but this was a job normally held by um, African Americans. And these were low paying jobs that were very instrumental in the civil rights movement. And to do them justice, they will get their own installment in the future, but <laughs> no idea when that's going to come because from what I already know, they are. this is a very rich and strong history that is generally overlooked in most history classes. So I need to do time to do it justice. Another innovation of the daylight was the triple section diner. Basically three cars that were linked together. They shared wheels in the middle. Um, the middle section as shown here in the picture was a um, was the kitchen area where, which is where all the food would be cooked. And then on either side, one side was the dining car. One side was the coffee shop, which is where you could get cheaper um, food, but it was still generally higher quality than anything available on Amtrak today. And um, in 1945, you could buy breakfast for like the equivalent of like seven or $8, lunch for about 10 bucks. And which was again, all fresh made, um, unlike food and Amtrak cafe cars, which is general and also was generally less than what you could get for a meal in today's Amtrak cafes and as well as the dining car. Also on one of the, um, what's it called? In documentaries I watched as a kid, it actually boasted that the revenue made off of the coffee shop actually paid enough to pay the wages of everybody on the train, or at least all the working people on the train. The dining car, generally speaking, had a better selection of food, which was higher quality doing, and would include a salad bowl at the table for no extra charge, and you could actually get it refilled as many times as you wanted. And meal selections would basically run between 11 and $17 in today's money. And um, they also had a specially catered wine by the Southern Pacific Hotel Division. Pop in some of the menus now um, just to look at. Um, the menu here is actually from the, for the dinner is actually from the Lark. So, and we'll get into what the Lark was in a little bit. Um, also one thing I do wanna show is I did forget to show the chair cars. So this is what the chair cars look like, which is basically like a Amtrak coach today. And it more or less was, and I do have another video on that as well as what um, accommodations were 
being used before Amtrak came around, and also from the Niles Canyon Museum. I actually do have a picture of what a restored Southern Pacific chair car looks like. Towards the 60s, 60s, they got rid of red and orange and black paint scheme and just went down to having it be the shiny metal or gray paint with the red strip along the top. Um, they did that to save a lot of money because keeping um, stuff painted was really expensive and the SP basically from the end of the 50s all the way through till the creation of Amtrak was really cheap about its passenger trains. It basically was trying to ruin them so they can get rid of them. Um, and they didn't obviously because Amtrak um, came around but anyways, um, on a more happy note for the daylight and the coast route in general, um, the daylight actually in its early time in the 1930s became so successful that the SP actually had to start a second run of the train almost immediately. At first, this consisted of older cars that ran on a slightly longer schedule compared to the streamlined daylight, which as I mentioned, the streamlined daylight ran the route nine hours and 45 minutes. So to compensate for this, the SP actually bought a whole new um, daylight train set, which was delivered and put into service in 1940. And they used the old equipment on the newly created noon daylight, and the new equipment was put on the morning daylight, which was basically just the first run of the train, um, rebranded slightly. And also at this time, the SP wanted to have a first-class overnight train to complement the daylights. So before we get into that, there's actually a couple notes I need to make. The um, SP also split off a couple chair cars in San Jose, um, the articulated set on screen now. Um, one of them would be hauled by a commuter train up the peninsula and make all the local stops, and then another one would be put on a train heading to Oakland, so it can make the stops up to Oakland. So anyways, I just forgot I was should have mentioned that beforehand, but anyways, getting on to the Lark, which was the overnight train between San Francisco and Los Angeles, again with a couple cars going to Oakland as well. So the SP went back to Pullman and bought more equipment for the all-sleeping car overnight train that was the Lark. So this train also had a triple section diner as well, but instead of a coffee shop, it can, contained a tavern lounge and the kitchen section was larger and had space for the queen. And the sleeping car came in various arrangements that, uh, that were popular at the time, such as open sections, roomettes, double bedrooms, compartments, and until 1957, it actually had no coach seats. And again, on uh, the room types of the pre-Amtrak um, railroads is older video, the first video on this channel. So if you would um, are more interested in that, uh, please give that a listen to. Also, for whatever reason, I actually couldn't um, find a good picture of the um, Lark. So I went with a heavily pixelated picture of the Cascades, which was the Lark sister train that ran from Oakland to Portland. Um, ran was the same paint scheme, similar setup. It was an all sleeping car train. It ran overnight, um, so on and so forth. It'll be talked about in its own video talking about the trains between the Bay Area and, and um, Portland, which is the northern end of the Southern Pacific system. And also just for a quick reference, this is what the inside of the dining car looked like on the daylight. From what I understand, it looked similar on all SP trains. It was basically just a car full of um, tables and because um, the kitchen was in its own separate section. So as time, as time went on, things started changing. So after World War II started, um, the coast route went through a bunch of changes, at least major changes. So during the war, the day, the noon daylight was suspended because there was a wartime restriction on the number of streamlined trains running any um, particular route. And the cars were then put on the San Joaquin daylight, but I'll go over that when I go over the San Joaquin route and basically the non-local quote-unquote trains on it. The noon daylight was quickly brought back in 1946 and lasted until 1949. It was canceled due to lower than anticipated ridership, and the equipment was used um, for an overnight run they called the Starlight. The Starlight, which by the way has no relation to the modern ghost Starlight, was um, an all-chair car overnight train that replaced the noon daylight and lasted until 1957 when the Starlight and Lark were combined into one train, which um, the SP did because of declining ridership and they just wanted to cut costs as much as they possibly could. And as time went on, um, again, passenger rail kept declining. The SP didn't want to invest in its passenger trains anymore and it basically just kept eroding them until people um, wouldn't ride them and the, either the CPUC in California or the ICC nationally would let them get rid of trains, which honestly they did with the Lark towards the end of its life, which was lost in April of 1968 after the mail contract was lost. And also a little quick aside on the mail contract, I'll get into this in a little bit more detail um, during the mail train video, but the mail contract is basically a backdoor federal subsidy to the railroads from passenger trains and its loss basically got rid of, from what I'm guessing, of anywhere from a third to half of the remaining passenger trains in the country, which um, again, was a massive blow to it, which is, if you're in Europe, is comparable to the beaching cuts of the 1960s, but was more due to subsidy loss than the just shutting down of um, train train lines at random, or at least at, well, that were supposedly not profitable. But anyways, um, as time went on, the daylight was the only, the once a day daylight at this point, 
which had no first class amenities because the and food service was basically gone at this point, and so was the first class amenities like a segregated um, lounge car um, was gone by the 1960s on the on it. This was just reduced to a once a day train and actually existed until until Amtrak was created in 1971 and was a supplemental four times a week train along the coast route to complement the Starlight, which at that time ran the other three days of the week. The Coast Starlight Amtrak's version of it is actually an amalgamation of three separate trains that ran between Los Angeles and Seattle, which was the Coast Daylight, the Cascade, and um, the Seattle-Portland pool connection, which was just a clustering of trains, as far as I understand, that ran between Seattle and Portland. One of them used to carry trains through to Seattle from Portland um, that were connecting from the Southern Pacific, which again will be a video um, that's on the someday list. So in the present time, which is what I mean by the post-1999 Amtrak California era, or 1999, 1999, Either way, same difference at this point. Um, there have been calls from various local governments and the state to restart the Coast Daylight. So far, these plans haven't really been acted on. Um, since the initial push to expand faster trains in the 90s, the state kind of has basically just been ambivalent at best towards Amtrak, California. And honestly, I would say mismanagement it to the point where it needed to kick it off to local governments. But instead of just using the local, the local JPA support to basically as a holding pattern, they have left it there. And honestly, in my opinion, the JPAs don't really <laughs> work well. But then again, future video. And also Amtrak as a whole is facing an equipment shortage, which is thankfully being um, relieved soon, and I might add years late. But even then, the coastline isn't in the shape it was, and there's frankly no plans to start running any trains. Um, like I mentioned, it takes the Starlight nearly 12 hours to make the trip from Los Angeles to Oakland, a trip that steam engines made in under 10 hours, and the daylights made in um, one pulled by diesel made about nine and a half at their height. So bringing about the Coast Starlight would take a lot of time, mostly repairing the coast route and actually getting new equipment. And as I said, there's no equipment, extra equipment to run extra trains, let alone a new one. But this can be easily fixed since train crash safety standards are being changed to be similar to European standards instead of basically being a um, bank fault on wheels, like which is our current logic of crash safety standard, which again, this will probably end up being in its own much shorter video. But this means that modified versions of old California cars could be built as well as Siemens Viaggio twin cars, Stadler bi-levels, um, all could be made in super liner equivalent cars or at least compatible. But again, this would take the state of California getting serious, which would mean um, them being willing to put billions of dollars into expanding trains and taking them over from the state and at least rationalizing local government to some extent, which is a thing that's not happening anytime soon. Like I said, that's a video for another time. Time. Anyways, I hope you've enjoyed this long and kind of rambly video. Hopefully I get better at making these. <laughs> but again, uh, thank you for being here. If you have questions, comments, whichever, um, leave them down below. Hopefully uh, you like what you hear and are willing to get on this journey of, um, well, coronavirus boredom. Anyways, have a good afternoon or whatever time it is, and I will hope to see you in the new one.